In today's video, I'm going to read Jeremiah chapter 17. There's a cool verse in here that I think kind of hints at the Mormons. And the Mormons, I think Mormonism is the biggest Freemasonic religion out there. And it's a corruption of Christianity. They pretend to be Christians, but they believe in all sorts of nonsense that is not, does not have anything to do with Jesus. And they clearly follow a false prophet with really, really not believable origin stories of golden Egyptian tablets or, or what have you. But I think the Mormons fit into the fake history thing because I think that, well, being very Freemasonic in origin, they know about fake history. And I think that the, the founders of Mormonism, they knew that there were cities, abandoned cities out west. And I think that's why they went out there to reclaim those cities. And a specific city and the Utah area, I think they kind of knew what they were looking for somehow. So let's get into it. I'm going to read uh, Jeremiah chapter 17 from the King James Bible. The sin of Judah is written with a pen of iron and with the point of a diamond. Already interesting. Yeah, we think of like ballpoint pens being really a uh, modern thing. But here it's talking about a metal pen. Written with a pen of iron and with the point of a diamond. And that too, like diamond etching. And how how we think of... They show us these ancient things where it's like they were, um, they were writing things into concrete it seems like some sort of concrete and a, a lot of times they tell us that these things are like chiseled painstakingly but i think it's really obvious that they're casting things they they cast a, a slab of something that's still wet or still pliable to a certain extent and they use stamps basically to press in to the material i think it's really clear that they had that they were really into that and all the ancient egyptian stuff that they tell you each little hieroglyph is like chiseled out. That's such BS. It clearly, it's like stamps. They have a, a positive mold of something and they're stamping it into the medium. I think it's really obvious when, when you just consider that aspect that they're stamps and not painstakingly chiseled one by one. Anyways, uh, that's one of those technology. They want you to think that that's old. Like because it's old and it's in a stone, it's low tech. But a lot of times people valued things that lasted. And so just because they had stone tablets with things pressed into them, that doesn't mean that they were low tech necessarily. It just means that certain times they had really, they had things that they wanted literally set in stone, not just written on a piece of paper or whatever. Anyways, it's just an interesting concept. Um, because things anyway i mean i've already said this but the fact that it lasts so long is actually impressive and it means that it doesn't mean that it was low tech ooga booga people and all they could do was sit there for thousands of hours chiseling things maybe these people actually just valued longevity and that part it is kind of partially tech to be able to make a concrete that lasts millennia Anyways, let's keep going with the... I just want to read this chapter and point out a few interesting things. Um, it is graven upon the table of their heart and upon the horns of your altars. Whilst their children remember their altars and their groves by the green trees upon the high hills. O oh, my mountain in the field, I will give thy substance and all thy treasures to the spoil, and thy high places for sin throughout all thy borders. I think it's interesting that there aren't a bunch of buildings on mountaintops. I think that these places have all been leveled by now. I, I have a hard time finding it, but I remember I was looking up high places in Ireland or something, and a lot of these mountains, the, the top of the mountain is just covered in rubble, like big boulders, and it's like, how did all those boulders get up there? And I think that a lot of times there were giant temples on top of these mountains, and today they're just reduced to boulders. Um, okay, continuing on. 
Verse 4, And thou, even thyself, shalt discontinue from my heritage that I gave thee, and I will cause thee to serve thine enemies in the land which thou knowest not. For ye have kindled a fire in mine anger, which shall burn forever. You know, people love the idea of eternal flames. Thus saith the Lord, Cursed be the man that trusteth... This is the verse that somebody wanted me to talk about, so here you go. Uh, Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 5. Thus saith the Lord, Cursed be the man that trusteth in man, and maketh flesh his arm, and whose heart departeth from the Lord. So I guess this is kind of a call to, for people to not be so helic, to not, to not think of the world as being, you know, only about the material and things of the world, and to keep their mind on God. At least that's my interpretation. It's interesting, though, that the Old Testament has a lot of cursing going on, and the very last, it's like the last verse of the Old Testament, basically, or one of the few last verses mentions curses. And Okay, verse 6, For he shall be like Heath in the desert, and shall not see when good cometh, but shall inhabit the parched places in the wilderness in a salt land and not inhabited. So this verse I found really interesting. Talking about the salt land makes me think of Great Salt Lake. Maybe this verse in particular was guiding the early Mormons to an old land that is biblical. People, I, I get comments every once in a while, people talking about uh, about the, the Grand Canyon and how the Grand Canyon is possibly Sodom and Gomorrah. I think that's very possible. If you look at the names of... of They give names to the various peaks, or I don't know what, what you call them, the parts of rock that are still there. In the Grand Canyon, they have weird names like Temple of Isis and stuff like that. So... All right, verse 7. Blessed is the man that trusteth in the Lord, and whose hope the Lord is, for he shall be, this is beautiful imagery right here, for he shall be as a tree planted by the waters, and that spreadeth out her roots by the river, and shall not see when the heat cometh, but her leaf shall be green, and shall not be careful in the year of drought, neither shall cease from yielding fruit. This is a verse that gets talked about a lot. The heart is deceitful above all things, and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, the Lord, search the heart, I try the reins, even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. As the partridge sitteth on eggs and hatcheth them not, so he that getteth riches, and not by right, shall leave them in the midst of his days, and his end shall be a fool. A glorious high throne from the beginning is the place of our sanctuary. O Lord, the hope of Israel, all that forsake thee shall be ashamed, and they that depart from me shall be written in the earth, because they have forsaken the Lord, the fountain of living waters. That gets talked about in Book of Revelation, the living waters. I mean, this is, I think, a theme uh, or a symbol that comes up multiple times. Heal me, O Lord, that I shall be healed. Save me, and I shall be saved, for thou art my praise. Behold, they say unto me, where is the word of the Lord? Let it come now. As for me, I have not hastened from being a pastor to follow thee. Neither have I desired the woeful day, thou knowest. That which came out of my lips was right before thee. It's interesting that pastor gets used so much in the Old Testament. It, And I don't think it seems anything like what pastors are thought of as today. So that's an interesting... Um, what What exactly did a pastor mean back in the day? Mm, where was I? Verse 17. Be not a terror unto me, thou art my hope in the day of evil. Let them be confounded that persecute me, but let not me be confounded. Let them be dismayed, but let not me be dismayed. Bring upon them the day of evil, and destroy them with double destruction. I just thought that's such an interesting verse, and the, it almost seems like, you know, magic talk. Like, uh, God protect me and send anything back times seven. I mean, I've, there's been times in my life where I've prayed protection like that and asked God to reflect the evil that's being sent at me. Sometimes you can feel spiritual attack and yes, you can pray to God to protect you, but I, I just relate with that. Like 
send it back at them double. And anyways, verse 19, thus said the Lord unto me, go and stand in the gate of the children of the people, whereby the kings of Judah come in and by the which they go out and in all the gates of Jerusalem and say unto them, hear ye the word of the Lord, ye kings of Judah and all Judah and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem that enter in by these gates. Thus saith the Lord, take heed to yourselves and bear no burden on the Sabbath day, nor bring it in by the gates of Jerusalem. Neither carry forth the burden out of your houses on the Sabbath day. Neither do ye any work, but hollow ye the Sabbath day as I commanded your fathers. But they obeyed not, neither inclined their ear, but made their necks stiff, that they might not hear nor receive instruction. So the rest of this chapter is about the Sabbath, and I think that this is just... It's just a very specific example. God was giving them, holding out his hand and giving them a chance to prove themselves. Because to, to go back to the verse that that somebody wanted me to, to talk about today. To to trust in the Lord and not in man. Don't, and to, and the other verse kind of telling you to don't be a helic, be, be more spiritual. So the Sabbath day is... It's, it is a rejection of the earthly things to focus on the spiritual things. So I think that this makes total sense why God is allowing them an opportunity to take the advice. And um, yeah, Sabbath doesn't get thought about a lot these days. It's been turned into like the Lord's Day and Sunday and going to church. Um, I mean, I'm not saying that I, I haven't been thinking about the Sabbath recently, so it's probably a message to me too, that somebody brought this up and yeah, it's a, it's an important thing. And I, I think it's a deep theological thing too. What the, the whole idea that God rested for a whole day and, and he gave us a day of rest for the week is a really interesting concept to me. And yeah, so verse 23, it goes to 27, so I only have a few more verses. But they obeyed not, neither inclined their ear, but made their necks stiff, that they might not hear nor receive instruction. And it shall come to pass, if ye diligently hearken unto me, saith the Lord, to bring in no burden through the gates of the city on the Sabbath day, but hollow the Sabbath day, to do no work therein, then shall there enter into the gates of this city kings and princes sitting upon the throne of David, riding in chariots and on horses, they and their princes, the men of Judah, and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and this city shall remain forever. And they shall come from the cities of Judah, and from the places about Jerusalem, and from the land of Benjamin, and from the plain, and from the mountains, and from the south, bringing burnt offerings, and sacrifices, and meat offerings, and incense, and bringing sacrifices of praise unto the house of the Lord. But if ye will not hearken unto me, to hollow the Sabbath day, and not to bear a burden, even entering in at the gates of Jerusalem on the Sabbath day, then will I kindle a fire in the gates thereof, and it shall devour the palaces of Jerusalem, and it shall not be quenched. How many old world cities have suffered giant fires in the past? It seems like almost all of these old world cities, they have the giant arch old gateways, and where's the walls of any of these places? The, all the walls are basically gone in a lot of these places. The Vatican still has a lot of wall. And I'm sure there's other places as well. Um, but I I think it's really interesting. <clears throat> the, the part at the end here about if you're going to follow the Sabbath day, you're going to have all these people come into your city. I, I think it just reminds me of people want to go in places that they can't go. And if imagine if there was a city that it's like you can't come in here and you can't leave here on a Sunday that that would almost become like a spectacle. And it, imagine, yeah, a huge city. Imagine if LA was just like blocking every Sunday, they totally blockaded all of the highways coming in and out of LA. That would be like an insane spectacle. And if they all were saying, we're doing this so that we can, so we can sanctify those days holy and worship God on these, on this day specifically, and no work happening on this day that would be a, an intense spectacle and would draw people there. That's just what I thought of that. Imagine a, a city today closing their gates down on Sunday and what would happen. Uh, okay. That's it for this video. God bless everyone.